Black Star Network is here. Hold no punches. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Black Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roller. Hey, Black, I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?
Hey, folks, today is Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Oh, Elon Musk continues to lie about DEI and this whole notion that we're going to have folks just dying because uh, of unqualified pilots and doctors. Michael Harriet with The Root uh, breaks it all down uh, as only he could. He'll join us on the show. Also, a report from the Democracy and Power Innovation Fund says millions of black and brown voters are missing or incorrectly listed in U.S. voter databases. We'll discuss that as well. Plus, another black female DA is being targeted, this time in Alameda County, California. Uh, Pamela Price is facing a recall. She will join us on the show as well. Plus, Donald Trump gets the green light to appeal Georgia Judge Scott McAfee's decision to keep Fonnie Willis on his uh, election uh, case. Two former Mississippi white deputies get their prison sentences for the torture of two black men. We'll also recap last night's Netflix uh, red carpet premiere of their new movie, Shirley, regarding Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, starring Regina King. It is time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Sun Network. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop of get a kick out of these white folks who love to lie about DEI, affirmative action, diversity, because their standard protocol is to say that, oh, standards are being lowered if we allow these people in. Well, one of the folks who continues to suggest those things is Elon Musk. Of course, uh, he uh, owns Tesla, SpaceX, and a whole bunch of stuff, richest person in the world, but frankly, an absolute idiot when it comes to these issues. And so, uh, he repeated this nonsense uh, in a conversation that he had with uh, Don Lemon. And so uh, I-, I hate to even uh, play uh, th- this sheer stupidity, but go right ahead. Listen, let's talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, all right? That's been a target of yours lately on X. You, uh, on, there was a repost of Ben Shapiro that you claim that DEI is killing people. Specifically, you point to medicine. You claim that DEI programs are putting people at risk. Do you really believe this to be true? And what evidence do you have to support it? Um, What I was referring to there was that if uh, if we lower the standards for doctors, uh, such so that they, you know, if if the test for a doctor is lowered, uh, then the probability of them making a mistake and killing someone is obviously going to be higher. Wait, say that again. I'm not sure I understand what you said. I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Yes, if if the if the standards for passing medical exams and becoming a doctor or, or especially something like a surgeon, if the standards are lowered, uh, uh, then it, the probability that the surgeon will make a mistake is higher. They're making mistakes in their exam. They, they may make mistakes with people, and that may result in people dying. What evidence do you have, though, that they're lowering the standards? Uh, there is no evidence of that. Well, I your... believe there is. There's no evidence of that, Elon. What, what is the evidence? I, I believe they have literally lowered the status at, at Duke University, and that is what the article was referring to. There's no evidence saying they have that. not lowered there's, the status? There's no evidence about uh, lowering standards, and I think that there is... Um, Leave that as a false statement you're okay. making. Okay. Well, well, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I, I think... The interesting thing is, when this is posted on the X platform, there will be a whole bunch of things that rebut what you said and what, what I said, right. and so people can then make their own decision based on the replies and the rebuttals and the community notes. I think that's fair, but I do think that w- on this particular topic, I do think that you and Ben Shapiro are, are reaching in uh, about this, because there was a, what, it, what Ben posted said that people were, he gave instances of people who were deliberately uh, harming people. Um, nowhere in the thread 
does Ben suggest at all, I should say, that anyone is being killed as a, a result of DEI? Um, that's purely speculative. Purely speculative. All right, so that was their back and forth. Uh, Michael Harriet with The Root joins us right now. Michael, glad to have you on the show. Uh, so, first of all, this is, this is beyond hilarious. And, and, and here's a piece that people need to understand. In the history of America, this is what white folks have always done. I don't care. Take the area. White folks of all racist white folks like Elon Musk have always suggested, oh, if, if we let them in, everything, quality is going down. Standards are going down. We're going to hell in the handbasket if we let these folks in. He is simply following the footstep, footsteps of white supremacists, white nationalists in the long racist history of the United States. Yeah, he, he definitely is. Well, I always have to begin this conversation, um, first of all, by uh, saying, you know, I'm, I'm with the Grio and that Elon Musk wouldn't be an American if not for the 1965 Immigration and Nationality Act. That was the result of the civil rights movement. That was basically a diversity program. Like he is an American because of diversity, equity and inclusion program that was started by black people in America. So we got like, that's the foundation of how he even gets to say these things, right? Like he, he's talking about, he's a free speech advocate when he's part of the diversity program that we created. Second thing is like the insinuation and the conflation of like lower standards with diversity, equity and inclusion is just something white people made up. Like none of those programs lower standards to get black people included or to get more black people in leadership. None of them do. Like right? it's literally illegal for us a, a college or a job or a company to do that. They don't lower standards. He's making it up. It the whole thing is premised on a lie. And the thing is that they believe it just because they say it and because they heard it from other white people. And that's the whole thing that you have to start with. And, 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 and the thing here, Michael, the, the, the thing that we have to recognize uh, is that they have in their mind, all of these jobs are ours. So how dare any of you step into our area? We're smarter. We're better. He, he, when he was attacking pilots, uh, he was saying, oh, let's show these 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 scores. And so Elon Musk, is, again, is using this uh, it, it to attack people. I remember the University of Te I remember when uh, during Jim Crow, all these white folks, at the University of Texas were concerned uh, about um, about black people coming in. And the president being the University of Texas goes, oh, don't worry about it. We have a secret weapon to deal with these Negroes. It's called standardized testing. They're not going to be able to pass the test. In your, in your Twitter thread, you broke down how, oh, first year? Yep. In terms of how uh, black and minority students operate, I think it was at uh, Duke uh, in their medical school. But then you show after that first year, oh, they were kicking ass and taking names. That's the stuff they never want to talk about. Right. Because, first of all, everyone in, at every college, like every scholar knows that standardized tests don't predict anything. Like the, all the colleges know it. And so when these colleges who are using data to say, hey, we might as well get rid of this standardized testing and use another metric to determine who we admit into our school, white people, because of the racism that has been embedded in their history and in their culture, they think that you are lowering standards by getting rid of something that doesn't measure anything anyway. But because they have historically performed well on a test that was, if you look at the history of the SAT, it was created to exclude non-white people. Because white people perform better on it, they think that their high test scores is indicative of their merit, of the fact that they belong there. It makes it's proof that they are smarter than all of the other people who have been traditionally excluded. So that's what they start with. 
And then when they see you getting rid of those tests, when they see more black students coming in because what schools are doing is using other metrics that are not culturally biased as they know that the SAT is, as they know that most standardized tests are, they feel like something is being test taken from them because when it really comes down to it, if you measure how well, how smart someone is objectively, they don't have that advantage, right? They don't have the advantage of a system and a test and and a whole education complex that was built to promote them. And when they see those things being dismantled because they are inaccurate, not just to get black people in, because ain't no school, no traditionally white education system in America or institution in America has just graciously decided that we want more black people. It don't happen, right? They're using metrics to get more students better students in because the college landscape is very competitive, right? And so when they use better metrics and the white people don't have the advantage that they used to, they think they're being discriminated against. And that's at the foundation of this entire argument. Argument. Well, Michael, I think about uh, Mary Fisher, who sued the University of Texas. Uh, and when the case with the Supreme Court, what was discovered was, oh, you thought black and minority people took your spot. No, it was white students who do, who had, who did, who had lower scores, but they were much broader students. It was white folks. And, and that's the whole deal. And with the Elon Musk of the world, and, and I laid this out in my book, White Fear, how the browning of America is making white folks lose their minds. This is all a part of this white fear. It's the attacks on CRT, DEI, affirmative action. They're going after every program. They Because this is what I say. White folks are scared. Racist white folks like this are scared to death to compete. And people need to understand, this ain't a conservative thing. It's some white liberals who think the exact same way. They are afraid to death that they that their kids are not going to have the same white advantages that they had. And they now say, damn, we got to compete against these black folks and Latinos and Asians and Native Americans. They, they didn't have to compete that same way before when it came to fellow white folks. And what's interesting about what uh, what they believe and what you just said, right, just as that case is um, the University of Texas, right, is that when you go to uh, these colleges, right, and you look at the, the collection of students who didn't make the standards to get in, it's mostly white kids. Remember a couple of years ago when those, uh, those uh, researchers did that uh, study on who got into Harvard and Yale and Ivy League colleges, and they, they found out that most of the people who got in through a legal loophole was the white people, diversity admissions, children of donors, children of people who work at the universities. Those were the white kids who got in. And if you removed affirmative action, what would happen is those white kids wouldn't be, well, still wouldn't get in. But if you remove legacy admissions, if you remove the children of donors from those loopholes, more black kids would get in. And in a sense, right, those black kids who are at those institutions are upholding the tradition and the reputation of those, those, uh, those institutions for those mediocre white kids who get in through those legacy admissions and all those legacy donor loopholes that the black kids don't have access to. I'm going to bring in my panel right now, uh, Scott Bolden. Uh, he, of course, lawyer there in Washington, D.C., joins us. Rebecca Carruthers, vice president of Fair Elections, uh, senator out of D.C., Reverend Dr. Todd Yeary, pastor and attorney, former EVP of Rainbow Push Coalition out of Baltimore. Uh, you know what? The, the thing here, Rebecca, uh, and if you got a question for Michael, go ahead. The thing here is we know exactly what Elon Musk is doing, and he's using his ownership of the platform to drive this, he's a lot. That's why he's brought these white trolls back, these white racists back a lot, and then under the guise of get free speech, 
Uh, but all of this, all of this is by design by people like Elon Musk, because what they want to do, it, it, I, I guess they think uh, that uh, th that's going to lead to a bunch of Clarence Thomases. You know, remember, he was just so, oh, my God, they're not accepting of me. And so he's despised affirmative action since. Whereas it's black folks like me, like y'all can go to hell. Y'all can try to question us all you want to, but we know we belong in every damn room we're supposed to be in. Well, here's the thing. Elon Musk is operating the way I would expect a South African who financially benefited from racist apartheid to act. Um, he is not a creator. He is a taker. He purchases companies after the creation um, has occurred, but he doesn't. He hasn't shown that he has specific individual thought where he's able to create and become a billionaire. Instead, he's able to purchase and then further increase his wealth. So my question to you, Michael, is, you know, I'm thinking about what even happened in Alabama today, and I'm thinking about Birmingham Mayor um, Woodfin, who's saying, hey, if the Alabama legislature decides that they want to attack D DEI um, in the state of Alabama, he's going to call for many of the five-star recruits and other top recruits to boycott um, Alabama sports. What do you think it'll take for these racist-led legislatures to understand that DEI is not going to go anywhere, even if they try to um, legislate it out of the state. Well, so I talked to, I actually talked to Woodfin about this. I uh, interviewed him and wrote about it about a week ago. And one of the things, first of all, again, just like Elon, these anti-DEI legislators aren't smart. They just have authority and power because they're white <laughs> in a state that they have, you know, taken control of the political system. But one of the things that they don't realize, like that law technically outlaws the NCAA, which requires a diversity part of every single individual football and athletic program, right? And when white folks realize, and, and we know they like, believe in like, DEI I, Saturdays. <laughs> Michael, we know they believe in DEI on Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and and what, someone do, what someone should do, right, is take the playbook that these anti-abortion activists should do and sue one of these schools who has the NCAA um, uh, football team on the basis of it's against the Alabama law now, so y'all got to shut down the football team, right? Like, get an injunction against the football team, and that will either make them rescind the law or do without their favorite set. Saturday pastime, you know which one white folks are going to choose in, in Birmingham. And, and, and Woodfin makes a great point that he had to raise money. Um, he started this initiative, right, called the Promise Initiative, right, that literally gives every child in Birmingham, a 95 percent black city, um, a, a opportunity to get their education paid for, everyone who graduates in the city and goes to a four-year or two-year institution, right? He had to raise that money for himself. And then he sits back and watches the University of Alabama and Auburn, which is my alma mater, parachute in on to recruit kids to go to these schools. Like literally land helicopters on the football field and say, will you come to our school and we'll give you this money. But they won't help any of those other kids. And now they are ignoring this DEI, this new DEI law on the grounds that we want to stay out of politics. And that's the advantage that whiteness gives them. Scott. I don't know why we even listen to white people talk about DEI and racism, because they, they are the least qualified to define it. Think about it. One. So whenever they talk about it, they talk about it with ignorance and with white privilege. So Elon Musk racism is even worse than what you all have discussed. Think about it. That in their mind, the only way black people could get into law school and medical school is for it to have a lower standard, right? And the history of affirmative action has never dictated that lesser qualified people of color be admitted or be given jobs. It had never been that. It's to cure past races and discrimination and prejudice against those who were qualified but denied, right? So now they have bastardized the whole piece rooted in ignorance and white privilege. What does their white privilege tell them? No. These spots that they did not earn, that they think they're entitled to, are now 
from a fairness standpoint, being taken up by black and brown people who are qualified. But the only way they can justify it in their minds because of their white privilege is to say we're underqualified or that the standards were lower. Usually there's a range of scores and a range of, of numbers that give you a grade. So the idea that if you got a lower grade, if, if this top was 1,000 and you got 950 or even 750, that somehow you're going to make a mistake operating on somebody or you're going to make a mistake flying a plane is just completely nonsensical. But this is the rhetoric, right? Because we know that the browning of America is as... as, as um, as Roland often says, they have scared the hell out of them, and they've got to do something to try, try to equalize it in their minds, because in 40 or 50 years, whatever that year is, in 2043, they're going to run out of arguments because it's going to be a country of color. So is there a question in there? Yeah, it's a question. Anybody disagree with anything I just pontificated on? <laughs> <laughs> Well, 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 the deal, you say, what? Well, first of all, you say, why do we listen to them? And here's the reality, Michael. They control, they hold power. And so what they're doing is they hold the power. You look at the lawsuits being filed. You obviously look at the Supreme Court affirmative action decision. You look at the lawsuits against the Fearless Fund. Uh, they're now, tar they're going to target every, everybody in corporate America, all of these programs. And so the programs that have been created, that have created some opportunities, and let's be clear, it's not like it's been a, just, just a plethora, creating some opportunity, they are going to go after every single one of these programs and folk had better understand uh, what's going on. And we're now going to actually see if our so-called allies in corporate America have the intestinal fortitude, Michael, to actually stand up and fight them. Yeah, and, and, and it's exactly what you guys said, because what we have to remember, first of all, is that these these standards that we are talking about, right? Like, you never hear them, these people who are so concerned about the state of the education system, crusading about why majority black schools are underfunded at about $2,626 less than majority white schools. They don't care about that. They don't care about the SAT being culturally biased. They don't care about um, schools in majority black neighborhoods um, having even smaller libraries. They don't care about the lack of uh, the gap in access to internet. They don't care about any of that. It's only, but only when they get to college or, or have to interact with white institutions do they think of these inequities, right? And they think of it in their favor. But the reality is, right, the truth is, like, the reason they listen to these people it's not because power role, and I, and I hate to disagree with you, but it's just because they're white, right? Like Christopher Rufo, who started this whole CRT thing, he don't have no power. He don't have no edu He's not educated. He's never spent a day being educated or experienced in the educational system. He literally has no credentials or no nothing. Well, well no, 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 no. So here's the thing. First of all, you, you, you're right. My, 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 Michael, you're right. He does it, but you have conservatives who have supermajorities, Florida, Texas, yep. Yep. Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, Arkansas, uh, again, Texas. And so the Rufos of the world, they create the template. And look, he's already said it. He said point blank. What we do is we create these things in the conservative e echo chamber. Then we drive it there. Then what we want to do is we want to now we want to we now want to embarrass so-called liberals or mainstream media to force them to cover, and then boom, they're like, yo, we got them. I mean, I remember when he went on Joy and Reed's show discussing CRT, and people were like, yo, man, Joy killed him, and I said, wasn't a good move. And, and nothing against Joy personally, but the reason I said it wasn't a good move, because what it did was exactly what Rufo wanted. He wanted it to be to infiltrate her program in Embassy NBC, and then all of a sudden you begin to see Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, USA Today. That's what their strategy is. We just have to understand when you're watching their strategy, to your point, like your lawsuit idea is a great one, but you got to have people who believe in this, who are progressive and others who are equally understanding of strategy. We, we know what they're trying to do. 
their whole deal is, is to, and he said it, we want to put everything under anything. You hear black, you hear minority, CRT, DEI, that's exactly what their strategy is. Yeah, I, I and I agree with that. I think part of their strategy, though, is premised on the fact that they're just listening to random white people. Like, like <laughs> right. none, of the, none of the DEI stuff comes from experienced people. It just comes from, from random white people. Todd? Let's talk about random white people for a minute, because I think that's at the core of, of the issue that white paranoia has broken out uh, due to uh, white mediocrity. When we think about what has happened recently in the DEI space on the heels of UNC and the Harvard decisions, uh, we, we have to remember that in the background is a Supreme Court that has been trying to find a creative way to undo Brown versus Board since it was a thing. And so we have a Baki, we have a UNC, we have a Harvard, because they are intentionally dismantling the leveling of the playing field around inclusion, right? Because at the end of the day, to, to Scott's point, is that affirmative action is not a justification for uh, a false inclusion of someone who's unqualified. It says once you have established that everybody in this pool is now qualified, you can use race as a mechanism to address historic uh, racial inequities, right? It's not that we're That's hiring it. unqualified people. We're hiring equally qualified if, if you lower the baseline to include random white people. But if we were really exactly. doing it at the standard that black people do it, the standards would be much higher and it's not even a competition. So, Michael, my question for you, in the midst of this litigation legislation moment, other than just kind of keeping up the strategy where we've always had to fight it out with the current court, 6-3, with state courts, and to, to uh, Roland's point, he basically called out all of the states of the Confederacy, who lost, by the way. That's, that's, that's a historical <laughs> fact. This, 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 this replaying of kind of an old tape, what is the thing that we need to be paying attention to before we get, in the words of that Spike Lee joint, bamboozled again? Like, I think one of the things that, like, the mis not, not necessarily mistaken um, assumptions that we have is when we get these victories, when we get an affirmative action into um, to colleges, when we get DEI policies, when we get an abortion law, when we get a voting rights act, we think we won when they never stopped con trying to dismantle it, right? Like, they, they never, like, their fight never ended, right? Even though we got the Voting Rights Act, they never stopped trying to stop black people from vote voting. And so I think, like, we have to realize that everything that we fight for is a continue. We have to keep continuing to make it a reality. And we can never assume that anything is a victory. It is just a step forward that we just have to lean on and make it closer to equality. Because in, in reality, right, like, they'll, there's nothing that we achieve that they won't try to dismantle. Right. So we have to simultaneously fight for progress while trying to maintain the advancements that we all we already made. And that like that's just the burden we have in this country. It's unfair. It is exhausting. But it's a thing that we have to realize. Well, and also what has to happen to close this out. Uh, we've got to have, we've got to stop having these so-called uh, exceptional Negroes act like they're the only ones. If you are a black board member, we need you to do more than just simply uh, pick up a check and you get stock options and help your family. If you're a black senior executive or even a CEO, we need you to do more. We need you to open that damn door and flood the zone like the white boys do. I mean, let's just be real clear. They hire who they want to hire. And it's, a, it's stunning to me. And I've had conversations uh, with black folks who become presidents of organizations and CEO, whether it's media companies or whether it's, you know, pharmaceuticals uh, or any other kind of company. It's like they get in there and it's like, oh, you know, I can't do too much. Uh, that, look, the, the hell you can't. The hell you can't. And the bomb, I look at it like, like, like the NFL. The Tony Dungy coaching tree is significant. Uh, if you begin to look at some other black coaches, uh, that's what they do. Uh, I, I'll pull up in a second uh, the brother who just uh, got hired 
uh, at, the, at the UCLA, okay, he got 12 coaches on his staff, 10 of them black. That's what you – listen, it ain't out of the perfect. norm or what? Huh? My, I'm saying Mike Tomlin is doing the same thing, right? Like, look at his quarterback room right now. Like, he he, he got a, It's an all-black quarterback room, right? Yeah, well, no, that's, that's his quarterback room. Uh, but, you know, my, Mike ain't had a great record of hiring black offensive and defensive coordinators. But that's another story. He is a cap of. Uh, but here's the whole, the, whole, the, whole, the whole point uh, here is, again. Uh, I knew you were uh, <laughs> You've got to do it. You can't do it. Can we get you one show without you effing with the Kappas, okay? Don't nobody say nothing about them alphas, okay? So let's just get through one show. Because you can't. But, but, but let me tell you this. If, if black people in senior C-level suites, if black people were appointees in high levels in the government, if they don't bring others along as they go along, why the hell are they there? What use are they if they're not opening these doors? If they're just thinking about themselves and their family, got it, okay. But you don't share our values. See, I say this all the time to you, Roland. I'm voting for people and supporting people, whether it's politically or financially or, or charitably. I support people who share our values, who, because black people ain't always supportive of our values as black people. And those are the ones that are self-serving. I want somebody in those positions who are going to bring others along as they go along, open those doors, and be fearless when they are the only ones in that room either making the decision or advocating or persuading people that don't look like them that this is the right thing to do. If they don't have that skill set, they shouldn't be in that position, period, full stop. And Roland, Robert is right here, because here's the bottom line. Rebecca, Rebecca, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, uh, here, here's the bottom line, and Robert's very right here. When black folks are appointed or, be, or are elected and become CEO, they're only going to be there for a finite time anyway. So even the whole mm -hmm. idea, I don't really want to rock the boat because I'm scared because I could be kicked out. Guess what? Your black behind is going to be kicked kicked out mm -hmm. at some point. So you might as well do the maximum benefit that you can for black folks while you have the position. This is America. And you You're not going to have that position until you die. And you're going to get kicked out quicker than your white counterparts. So you better get to getting while you're there. <laughs> that, look, that's, that's the... You'll get that, up for a year or two. Uh, Michael, final comment. <laughs> right. I, Michael, I think, final comment. The I think the bottom line is that, like, white folks and need to stop with their tears and realize that there's some, something called facts and reality. And like no one's tr coming to take things from them. And all they got to do is just try to be excellent instead of mediocre. And they wouldn't have to worry about any of this. That's right. Fair enough. Well, uh, I agree with you. Agree with you there. Uh, and just so y'all thought I was joking, this is the UCLA uh, football coach. Uh, my man, said, Eric Bieniemy, uh, is on his team. And you see Deshaun Foster. That's the coach. Look at this here. Uh, associate head coach, offensive coordinator, brother. Got a got a, a Afro Latino brother as office of defensive line coach. A brother, wide receiver coach. We got uh, uh, Rick Neuheisel's son as a tight end coach. Uh, Brian Norwood uh, is a, uh, another black coach. Uh, Cody Whitfield, Ted White, Tony Washington, Marcus Thomas, uh, uh, I can't, uh Malo. My man got. I mean, he he look, look. He went out and said, "Hey, this how we gonna do it." I, actually, I said too. He got he got one white coach on his staff. And let me be real clear: if this was any other uh, team, guess what? And they had one black coach. <laughs> Would nobody be saying nothing? Cause they used to that. They, they used to that. That's how you do it. All right, <laughs> Michael Herrick. I appreciate it, my brother. Thanks a bunch. Look at this, C. C. Scott. I told you. You know, when, when you got Omegas with some sense, I bring them on like Michael. I bring them <laughs> oh, on. Oh really? Oh so really? I, you know, I, 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 I look. That 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 there are exceptions to Omegas and Cats. <laughs> All right, we got to go. Uh, let me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to a break. We'll be right back. Rolling my nuts on the Black Star Network. You know how we do it. This is an alpha show. I have something I want to tell you.
I am running for president. Of the United States? Holy. I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You're going to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Freedom! Truly, you can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. Creation! This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that there were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. See too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. We're living it proud. I don't think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You're going to do all that. I'm a school teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Twenty-five million black and Latino voters are missing or incorrectly listed on databases. This is according to a report from the Democracy in Power Innovation Fund. Databases are sold by for folks in politics and used by campaigns to conduct voter outreach. Joining us right now uh, is Miriam McKinney Gray, the founder and CEO of McKinney Gray Analytics. Uh, she analyzed the data based on U.S. Census records, joins us from Elk Ridge, Maryland. Glad to have you, Miriam. So um, of the 25 million, where are they located? Are they dispersed even across the country or are they in a lot of southern states? Hi, thank you for having me. I want to say that first of all. Um, this is across the United States generally. So this number is based on Stanford research that was published a couple of years ago that talks about the issue of voter file missingness. Um, they use survey data, they go and they talk to people in their homes, and then they compile the results um, of being able to match two voter files. So in the end, what they found was that black and brown people were missing or mislisted at a much higher rate than white counterparts, and this is across the country. So what I did was I really took the census citizen voting age population data and did a broad um, estimate of how many people are missing across the United States. Uh, and look, that's a big number. And look, that we start, that, that's margins of victory. Again, Sherry Beasley lost Chief Justice of Supreme Court, North Carolina, by 401 votes. You look at Biden Harris winning Georgia, winning Arizona, winning Nevada. And so this matters. And what we see is we see these Republicans in a lot of these places, uh, you know, removing folks from the voting rolls. Uh, the Supreme Court allowed that to happen. It was a white man in Ohio who actually sued. The Supreme Court said, yeah, y'all can go ahead and remove him. And just because he hadn't voted uh, in several different elections and they are using these methods to purposely uh, trim folks off because that can make the difference between winning and losing. Absolutely. And one question that I've often fielded after publishing research on this topic is, you know, why are folks missing? What are the reasons why, you know, approximately 25 million? And this is likely a um, on the lower end of the estimate. If you take into account the fact that the census routinely undercounts black and brown communities. So the number is likely higher. Um, 
I field the question, you know, why are folks missing? And one of the number one reasons is voter file purges. So, you know, after a certain amount of time, if you haven't voted or say you've moved or whatever reason, um, whatever the reason may be, you could be vote, uh, purged, excuse me, from your state's voter file. And this could be erroneous. Um, and this is largely one of the reasons why folks are missing. Also, moving from location to location frequently. So we see that renters are often missing or mislisted um, at a much higher rate than homeowners. And it definitely correlates to socioeconomic status. Um, additionally, we see things like incorrect voter file models that are sold um, by com commercial data vendors. Uh, they can incorrectly predict whether or not you're a black person, whether or not you're white. Um, and these types of models are something that I talk about in my research as well. Um, they are really a newer sort of concept. I don't think that the greater public really knows too much about them. I recently learned about them, you know, only about 10 years ago when I was in graduate school. So these algorithms that are based on voter files actually can be really inaccurate, especially if you're black. And then that then plays into the voter file missingness. So it's very much a cycle and it's all related in that way. Questions for the panel, Rebecca, you first. Well, thanks so much for being um, on here tonight. Um, you know, in my previous role, I've worked in campaigns for about 20 years, and I noticed um, like around 2012 is when I started to see the predictability on race. And like, as you said, from working on the campaign side, I've often had access to that data. And the data on white people were accurate, but the data on black people um, was wildly inaccurate. Um, um, Latinos, it was a little bit more accurate because it looked at surnames. And then with um, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, it also looked at surnames as well. Um, so my question for you, you showed the data. There was a recent New York Times um, piece that talked about upwards 14 million um, black voters um, have been um, left out um, from voting since the Shelby case. Um, so that's been about, you know, 11-year uh, buildup. So in your research, um, do you have possible solutions on how to reach out to this missing um, 25 million folks? Yes, definitely. I've talked about this topic with my colleagues for about four years now since I started my work with the DPI Fund, and we've come up with lots of different tactical solutions. Uh, one of them is that folks that we work with, so local and national power building organizations that focus mainly on contacting black and brown communities and uh, empowering them, that these organizations should curate their own voter files. So whether that be purchasing like a com commercial, excuse me, data file from a vendor um, and then adding to it or um, changing things, making sure that things are correct, that is an option. You know, creating your own lists of people with demographic information, accurate address information, that is really important. You know, we know each other and we have to build on the trust of our family and friends. That's really important. That's something that I advise. Um, another thing which is related would be lean into relational organizing rather than get out the vote based on a voter file. So again, family and friends, uh, making sure that you are creating text campaigns as at your organization so that folks can make sure that they are reaching out to 10, 20 folks within their own communities and then getting information from them. And then a third solution would be leaning into same day uh, voter registration. So many US states have this ability. I think it depends on um, the type of election in some states, but the ability to register to vote on the same day of an election is important. And if you can get out that knowledge and information to the people in your membership bases, that can be really pivotal and important. Todd? I'm, I'm interested in the disaggregation of, of some of the numbers. The Electoral College elects the president, so it's not a popular vote. And when we look at where these purges are taking place, has there been any look back on the outcomes of elections to see 
what these purges have actually turned into in terms of real-time election results that could have swung the other way had the purging not taken place. Definitely. So two of my colleagues at the DPI Fund, um, one, her name is Liz McKenna. She's now at the Harvard Kennedy School. And another, my colleague, Tianyi Hu, is, um, does data analysis uh, alongside myself. Um, they put together a report. They've been working on it for a while, but I believe it recently published, where they looked at um, winning the Midwest. So recent elections that were happening in states like Michigan, um, Minnesota, and they looked at the voter file purges that actually happened over the past, I think it was at least five or 10 years. Um, and they compared the margins of victory in those years. And it really is the, uh, the case that these voter file purges are affecting elections, in my opinion, and that we would be winning more of them if these voter file voter file purges were not happening. <clears throat> like thousands of people, right? And then you compare it to how many um, votes won that election, either one way or the other, and it's those thousands. So it really, this is really the topic that I think uh, could make or break an, an election, especially this year. Scott? Yeah, thank you for being on. But the, the 25 million, the analysis can't end there. I mean, think about it. I understand the strategies for going after them, but if I'm purged from a voter roll and I'm a voter, I registered, then why is the onus on us to go back and get those voters? How come those 25 million voters aren't, um, aren't raising their hand or screaming or showing up to vote and they're not on the roll and, and they're not registering again? I mean, aren't, we, aren't the 25 million missing people from the voter roll, aren't they partly responsible if they don't try to vote or fix what's wrong with them? I'm not blaming them, but I'm, I'm kind of partially blaming them. What's your analysis to say about that? Yeah, that is a really good point. I've thought about that as well. Um, I would say that mainly what has fueled me in continuing this research and when thinking about that question is the outrage I feel about how these systems, I feel uh, particularly circumvent marginalized communities, so black and brown people, and what it feels, it feels to be on purpose. So when you start to look into like issues of vote, voter file missingness or vote propensity being so inaccurate for black people, it feels like it's all done for a reason and maybe it is. But I would say that, you know, if you're a person who's missing, from a voter file, it's likely that you're never going to be contacted by a traditional campaign or even um, maybe even a state-based campaign, right? They're not going to see you. They don't know where you live. They have no idea who you are. And so how would they ever be able to help you and give you some information? They wouldn't. And so with popular methods that currently exist in politics, uh, yes, these millions of black and brown people are completely invisibilized, left in the dark. And while, like you said, um, as adults, it is partially our responsibility to maintain awareness of things going on, I would also say that the white people who aren't missing from voter files don't have to deal with this, right? They get sent mailers, they get called, they get people showing up to their houses, canvassers. They don't have to remember every little thing. People are showing up to their door to sh remind them. Yeah, so, but, but white don't... people get purged too. Are you saying white people don't get purged? I guess what I'm saying is that 25 million black and brown voters have to be affirming in some way, shape, or form. They they thought enough about voting to register, and now they get purged. They know about elections coming up. I mean, how come they're not voting or trying to re-register or doing something to effectuate being invisible voters? I, I want to share the responsibility well, with well, okay, well, they're well, being purged. Well, because be purged, because. But I, how come black people aren't affirmatively trying to re-register or vote? Well, well Scott, my... Well, because my first, of, first of all, no, well, well, because, well, because, well, because, because, Scott, let's be real clear. Let's be real clear. Hold on one second. Let's be real... I'm going go to Rebecca. Let's be real clear. First, a lot of people don't necessarily know the elections are coming up.
I mean, I'm telling you right now, as somebody uh, who has been on the road, uh, not not everyone knows. Let's also talk about elections. When we talk about elections in this country, uh, obviously the presidential election gets all of the attention. But you've got a, any number of elections, state, county, school district, uh, you know, bond initiatives or whatever. The problem still is, is that when you have these Republicans who are trying to use every uh, maneuver to shave uh, folks off, to me... If somebody hasn't voted in two years and they still living at the address, I don't understand what the problem is. Uh, but you have folks who are by design trying to pick people off. Look, the study was done in Georgia. They broke it down. It was only, what, four or five people who were responsible for trying to challenge the voting registration of uh, 20, 30, 40,000 people. Uh, and so they are passing laws that are letting uh, these renegades uh, do all they can to target people. That's a huge part of this problem. Rebecca, real quick before I go to, go to break for my next guest. Yeah, so, Miriam, my organization actually filed multiple lawsuits, including several lawsuits in Wisconsin over voter purge. And, Scott, what happens is um, voters are contacted two ways. Either if they're a local elections clerk, where they're getting information, that, hey, there's a vote um, coming up, here's your registration, check your registration, or parties mm -hmm. are reaching out to them because they're utilizing a voter file. What happens when okay. these people don't show up accurately in the voter file we also see when you have voter purges that are nefarious that are going on, not the list maintenance that the, la that the law allows, these people aren't mm -hmm. being told that they're being purged from the list. Instead, they will show up, they will try to vote, and they're told, oh, well, you can't vote today or we'll give you a provisional ballot. That's not the same as letting them know, hey, you were kicked off, you actually need to go, and you ne need to fix this defect. So the issue is a lot of people who were registered to vote wanted to stay registered to vote aren't being told that they're being kicked off of rolls, or if they get kicked off or they have issues on the day of voting, they're not always being told why. And unfortunately, this dispropor disproportionately impacts black voters and then voters with um, Latino sounding surnames and Asian sounding mm -hmm. surnames. This is a reality in a lot of um, uh, states in our country. Got it. And then it's and then it's compounded and then it's compounded uh, and then it's compounded not only by that it's compounded by the moving of uh, voting locations, changing, shutting of uh, polling locations down. I mean, it's 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 a whole, look. It's a whole it's a whole voter suppression is an entire industry. Uh, Miriam, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you so very much, uh, folks. Uh, Got to go to break. We come back. We're going to be chatting with another black female district attorney, a progressive, being targeted. A recall effort this time in California. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Support us in what we do. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Send your ticket money order. P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C. 20037-0196. Cash app, Dallas Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. YouTube folks, y'all watching. Hit the like button, y'all. We should easily be over 1,000 likes by now. Also, download the Black Star Network app, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. Back in a moment. And it actually called me. And she said, do you remember us having an argument in the studio, whatever, whatever? And I said, no, not really. Because we never argued in the studio. Uh -huh. And she said, well, there's this piece we found, and can I, can you come over and watch it with me? And I said, sure. And I went over and watched it, and I loved it. I just started laughing. I said, this is great. This is great, Jenny. And she said, okay, so you're okay with this? I said, yeah, I'm fine with it. Because literally, we worked together for, I mean, I don't know how many days we've been in the studio together. And literally, we had maybe one arguments like that right and it was captured but of course that's the thing that you know absolutely people want to see but yeah that kind of thing happens some days that's with you know your voice isn't good today let's just go see a movie or let's go just chill or but, you know some days it's tough love like you got to do that again Sherry Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered.
Well, folks, uh, it has been common to see uh, black female district attorneys being uh, targeted uh, and attacked. We've seen it all around the country, and now it's happening in Alameda County, California, where Pamela Price is facing a recall. Uh, look, she was recently elected to the job. Uh, now folks are suggesting that uh, that her uh, criminal justice reform efforts are, are causing significant problems with crime in the area. Opponents have been actively gathering petition signatures to force a recall election since July, they've raised $212,000 from donors, including prominent tech executives, retirees, and former prosecutors. Pamela Price joins us now from Oakland, California. Pamela, here's what's so crazy. You were barely in office, and they were blaming you for crime, and it was like, um, I wasn't here. We saw what happened in San Francisco, recall there of the DA there. Uh, you have all these people going, oh, my God, crime is out of control, but... How can you blame a person who wasn't even here when these things were happening? Uh, and do you believe that this, look, that they're simply blown this out of proportion and they don't want to own up to the conditions that have been created by many of these tech companies in Oakland and San Francisco as contributed to the problems there? Clearly, what has inspired the attacks against me is politics. It's a political attack against progressives and particularly progressive district attorneys. And certainly as a black woman, I have experienced it at the most extreme level. But it's not an accident. It's very intentional. And so it's very unfortunate that my community has been targeted as well. Um, on that particular point, so you've now been, you were elected DA when? Jan, I was elected in November of 2022. And we took office in January of 2023. And you're right. While I was still unpacking boxes, assessing where we were going to land in the office, they started a recall. Okay, so you've been in office now 15 months? <laughs> and yeah. they were citing, they were citing, oh, these reforms she's instituted aren't working. You hadn't even instituted them yet. No, I had not. The first petition to start the recall started in February. And then the first rally of last year. I took office in January. In February, they started a petition to recall me. And then in April, they had their first rally with signs and banners, very well financed. There they are, signs, banners, financed, well financed already before we had done anything. So it's not about my policies. This is about politics and moving the country to the right, particularly in the realm of criminal justice reform. Um, so how, how do you respond to your critics? I mean, what are you saying to them as they try to say, oh, it, it, it's her policies, it's all her? One of and who's standing with you? We, we say often every lie has an expiration date. And so what we are telling is the truth, which is that I am protecting public safety. I am working for and about victims, having been a victim myself uh, in many ways. I'm a survivor of sexual assault, of sexual harassment, of police misconduct, as well as the foster care and the juvenile justice system. So I bring all of that lens of experience, lived experience, to this position. And I understand how victims are treated by the system and what they go through and what they need. And so what I say to them is we are working on improving the services that we provide to victims, despite the, the allegations that we don't care about victims, that I am in charge of an office that has 400 plus employees and 10 locations. And we are doing an excellent job of rebuilding this office because the, what we found was that it lacked systems of management, accountability, and communication. And we've taken that task on, and my team has done an outstanding job over the last year. And we are prosecuting people every day in Alameda County. So our strategy is to tell the truth. Questions from my panel, uh, Todd, you're, you're first. 
I, I was interested in looking at the, the video that was playing as you were talking about the situation there in Alameda County, uh, about where they found some of the folks to hold the sign. Some of it just seems to be a little bit incredible for me. Who is actually behind this move to push for this recall? Usually there's a money interest and, and an identity either individually or by an organization. Who is, who is actually behind it, and what are we doing to actually discredit the source of the effort to discredit you? We have identified those... Uh, millionaires who have funded this recall. In particular, one person, Andrew Dreyfus, has spent more than a half a million dollars on it. These are real estate developers. As people may know, Alameda is under the stress of gentrification, particularly my beloved Oakland. And so there are real estate developers that don't want to see a progressive prosecutor who will try to fix our problems without over-criminalizing and locking people up. So we've identified the millionaires. This is, they've spent $3 million to get signatures for this recall. And if it were not for that $3 million, we would not be having a conversation. What's the value of the land Scott? that they're trying to take control over? I'm sorry. Oh, we have a, Alameda County is beautiful area. Oakland is perfectly situated. We are at the crossroads of the East Bay. It's a fabulous area. We're, we have, on the south, we have the uh, Silicon Valley. On the north, we have the Napa Valley. So we are perfectly situated for people to want to come in and move folks out and take over this property. It is a land grab, for sure. Yeah, but, but uh, Scott's got them here. But Pamela, having represented female district attorneys as a criminal defense lawyer, I agree, you all are all under attack. But what makes your piece unique is that the recall started 30 days, roughly, after you were duly elected. Your discretion is key to your position. And others that don't look like you all around this country have been free to exercise discretion because the people, the voters, have said they trust your discretion. Here, it started almost immediately. I understand what you're saying about the tech people and the real estate people, but they're not even in your bailiwick. They're businesses, of course, but you've only been in office about a year. We know that police reform and prosecutorial reform and not prosecuting low-level uh, uh, crimes works. There's empirical data from, like, Johns Hopkins to say that it works and it frees resources. And you look at bad cases from 20 years ago and you take another look at them. That all works and makes the system better. I know you're saying that. But there's got to be something else at work here, because I'm a former prosecutor. I've been in criminal defense for 30-plus years. You just got in. There's got to be something else. I mean, maybe they don't like your hairdo, but that's no reason to recall you. My goodness. <laughs> Well, I like your hair, by the way. I'm just, I'm using how silly an example. I'm using a silly example as to why someone would get recalled within a year, within months of being elected by the people. Yeah, they like my hair well enough to elect me to this position. Right, <laughs> right. I am the first non-anointed, non-appointed district attorney in Alameda in a hundred years since Earl Warren left. And you are absolutely wow. right. Before I was elected... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry, Pamela. Repeat that again. I am the first non-anointed, non-appointed district attorney in Alameda mm -hmm. County in 100 years. So, wow. ba so basically, uh, the, the powers that be in Alameda County uh, did not pick you. The people did. That's exactly right. The people elected me. It's the first time we actually had a choice where the incumbent was not on the ballot since 1938. And before that, Earl oh. Warren was appointed wow. in 1985. Yeah, it was and an open so election, Roland. They've just been appointed by our board of supervisors. And before I was elected, nobody was questioning what the district attorney was doing, what her policies were, what, what the right. practice was being hired. None of that was even 
reviewed, much less challenged in the way that I have been. Wow. Wow. Um, so, so where does this recall effort stand? Where, where, where does it, um, so is, 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 is what, they, how many signatures do they have to gather to trigger an actual recall election? So the problem in Alameda County, we have a charter and it's not a problem. Our charter is the law of our county. The charter has one number. The state law has another number. So when this started, the charter was the law, but the Board of Supervisors and the county knew because no one had ever done this before that the charter had problems. They weren't going to be able to comply with the charter. And so they started picking and choosing what parts of the charter they liked and what parts of the state law they liked. So they picked the part of the charter that said they needed 73,000 signatures. The charter also says that those signatures should be gathered by people who vote, are registered voters in Alameda County. They decided they didn't have to ha follow that part. The charter also says that they, the registrar has to count the ballot, the signatures, with and verify the signatures within 10 days. They decided they didn't have to follow that part. So we are beyond the 10 days. We don't have, the only law that we have right now is the charter, but they're not following the charter. <laughs> they're picking and choosing pieces from the state law. All right, then. Well, we'll keep monitoring and see what happens there. Uh, keep up the fight, as I'm sure you will. We will protect the win. And if folks want to help us, we contemplating legal action based on what we're experiencing. Please go to protectthewin.org and check it out and donate if you can. Thank you so much for having me. Pro protect, protectthewin.org. Pamela Price, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Former Mississippi cops, racists, they get their sentence. One of them is going to spend a long time in jail, hoping not to drop the soap. I'll tell you about it when we come back. Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. I have something I want to tell you. I am running for president. Of the United States? Holy. I'm paving the road for a lot of other people looking like me to get elected. Brooklyn's first black representative. You're about to make history. You want to be president? You ain't no man. Maybe we should find your mother. All you got is your one vote. You sound just like every other politician. Do I look like every other politician? Freedom! Truly. You can't win. And why can't I win? I have an opportunity to make a difference. This isn't a campaign. It's a joke. The only thing anybody's going to remember is that there were a bunch of black folks who made fools of themselves. See too much suffering. And I don't know how to not try. I think I'm special. I just want to remind people what's possible. We need something that's going to make some noise. The Black Panthers and Shirley Chisholm. It's like thunder and lightning. I'm going to force all the politicians to be held accountable. You're going to do all that. I'm a school teacher from Brooklyn. Harriet was just a slave. Rosa was just a domestic. What is it you do for a living again? It's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Shepherd Talk Show. You're watching Roland Mark Unfiltered. So, folks, remember we told you about those uh, white cops in Mississippi, now former cops? 
uh, who viciously tortured two black men. Well, two more learned their fate today in a federal courtroom. Daniel Opdyke was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison for the January 2023 racially motivated torture and sexual assault of Michael Jenkins and Eddie Parker, as well as a subsequent plan to cover up their crimes. Abdi cried during the sentencing and said that his time in prison so far has helped him reflect on how I transformed into the monster I became that night. Christian Deadman was spent 40 years in prison for his role in torturing Jenkins and Parker. Former Rankin County Sheriff's Deputy Brett McAlpin and former Richland Police Officer Joshua Hartfield we sentenced on Thursday. Hunter L. Ward and Jeffrey Middleton were sentenced on Tuesday to 17 and a half and 20 years in prison. You know what, uh, Todd, if, um, if I had to play a song right now, it'd probably be my homeboy from Houston, Scarface. No tears. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to muster up a little bit of concern when, quite honestly, the, uh, the sentence should include not only time but experience. Let the same thing be done unto you that you did unto others. That's called the law of reciprocity. But since uh, they've been spared that, now they get to come away with this uh, all of a sudden uh, redemptive response that says, oh, I can now see the error of my ways. It's amazing what getting caught does uh, to make you see the error of your ways. But the truth of the matter is, is that uh, there's a system that enabled this behavior all the way up to uh, the point that they were actually caught. Uh, and so uh, we have to go back and not just find a bit of satisfaction in their sentencing, but some motivation to go back and change the system that allowed it to flourish and fester until it got to this point. We've got more work to do. Scott, um, I ain't trying to hear a damn thing from these racist bastards. Yeah, you know, two points I want to make. These, this goon squad, they, they were especially inhumane. They, they not only sodomized and beat and shot and and uh, and other things to these two black men, but as a, they had a reputation, they did this to a white uh, motorist uh, before they even did this to these two black men in this house who were living with allegedly living with a white woman. This is like something out of a movie. I mean, this is just pure evil. That's the first thing. Second thing is uh, Todd is right. The the sheriff, this goon squad. The sheriff knew about this goon squad. Everybody on the force knew about this goon squad because you can't have a name like goon squad without it being known. And so, how some about the festering and the system? This comes from leadership. Because if leadership knows about it and tolerates it, then leadership needs to go. The sheriff of this county or this police department, the lead, right? He's still there and he can only say they went rogue. They didn't go rogue. They went inhumane. I mean, it's just beyond just police brutality. If you can get beyond police brutality, they really did a number on these two black cats, as well as a white motorist. How often do you see facts like that with these four or five really bad, bad cops that were allowed to stay on the force under the name of Goon Squad? And so that's the problem with local and federal police departments. The leadership at the top does not keep their own people accountable. Then they come in when something goes wrong like this, very wrong. Then they want to do cleanup, Band-Aid, and keep their jobs. The problem is, if you tolerate bad apples, you are as bad of an apple if you tolerate it as the bad apples that maimed and killed and brutalized innocent citizens. Full stop. You know, Rebecca, uh, what, what amazes me is to listen to these folks, these shares, and others. Oh, we, we were just unaware of these things. Man, cut this crap out. That's we all. Shit. First of all, we are not talking about we are not talking about major cities. We're talking about small right. small towns. They knew about these goons. They knew about these thugs. And so I'm not buying none of that crap. None of it. Not at all. Not at all. Over and over, Rebecca, we say, oh, it's just a few bad apples. But here's the thing. I'm convinced each time that we cover stories like these is that any time you have an inherently racist institution that was created post-slavery, 
to make sure the newly freed black folks were under heel or to force these newly freed black folks back into um, indentured servitude, aka um, sharecropping. And then when we saw the rise in um, prisons as a way to have free labor through the 13th Amendment, the more I'm convinced these are racist institutions. So I don't even think a racist institution, the way we're seeing the outcome with many law enforcement agencies in this country, I don't see how there is reform. So, you know, uh, uh, when George Floyd happened, there were many folks who were up in arms saying defund the police. And a lot of people who were dealing with respectability politics said, well, no, we need police. Do we? Before we had th this modern day law enforcement agencies that do very anti-black things, we had Pinkertons, we had detectives. Those were people who actually solved crime. Instead, we're seeing state funded and state allowed terrorism on black people in this country that unfortunately is happening at the hands of law enforcement. So at some point we have to figure out with whether or not this, if this is working for us. And it's very clear each time we cover stories like this, that this status quo is not working for us. Not just not working for black folks, but it's not working in this country. No, it's uh, it's not. But, uh, but uh, look, uh, I appreciate, again, an aggressive uh, Biden-Harris Department of Justice Civil Rights Division uh, that uh, did their part here uh, and uh, got these uh, guilty pleas. And so, again, yeah. I hope these thugs stay in jail for a long time and say hello to all the brothers y'all might encounter while you are there. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Control Room, do y'all have a Jasmine Crockett video? All right, y'all, uh, earlier today, this is our last story, uh, today on Capitol Hill, they had another one of those stupid impeachment discussions that, had, it gone, that hasn't gone anywhere. Democrats are roasting those, these fools. Ooh, but that was nobody roasted them like Texas Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett. I just had to play this here, and I can't wait to get the panel's uh, reaction to this. Roll it! Do you know who Elections LLC is? Yeah. Back. Well, it's not a who. Okay, well, do you know what it is? Yes, it's a LLC. Okay, and is it the LLC that your attorney works for? Uh, I believe so, yes. You believe so, okay. Um, so at this point in time, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a document indicating that the law firm representing Tony Bobolinski was paid $10,000 as recently as January of this year by the Save America PAC, which you may recognize as Donald Trump's PAC. Without objection. Thank you. Now, so far in this hearing, it has felt like the worst episode of The Apprentice. I'm sure you're familiar with that show. It seems like my colleagues and maybe you and some others are trying to become the next vice president of the United States of America. You're auditioning or something like that because, Mr. Bobolinski, I know that you take exception to the fact that your credibility has been called into question over and over. But when someone comes to testify under oath, whether it's before this committee, behind closed doors, or in person, then we have to evaluate someone's credibility. And, sir, I definitely have always had issues with your credibility, as I know that you are very well aware of. So let me remind you of well, what you, happened behind <coughs> closed doors. I well, you should asked, ask Roe about my asked credibility. You a question. Okay? You are? When I, I haven't. So oh, when okay. I ask I'm you a sorry. question, that's when you answer. Otherwise, I'm talking. So, Excuse me? with my time, because it's my time, I want to be clear that when we were behind closed doors, you called a number of people liars. You called the Wall Street Journal liars. You called Cassidy Hutchison a liar. You called yes. the FBI a liar. You called Rob Walker a liar. You called James Gillier a liar. You called Hunter Biden a liar. You called Jim Biden a liar. And just today, you added to your list, you called my colleague, Congressman Mr. Goldman, a liar as well. It seems like, according to you, the only person that's telling the truth is you and everyone else is lying. But... 
I want to move on to something else. Is that a question? It's or? not a question. Oh, OK. You'll know when I ask you a question, I promise. Thank you. So the other thing that I want to talk about is um, the fact that my colleague from the other side of the aisle talked about the company that we keep. And she wanted to go through a list of people that she felt like were a bad company because right now the majority has been relying upon the testimony of someone who's currently sitting in federal prison. And we know that your company is the company of somebody who's been found liable of fraud, uh, as well as defamation, as well as sexual uh, assault, and for whatever reason can't pay his bills uh, at this point in time. But I'm going to ask Mr. Parnas, so this is a question to him. Are you aware if Trump had any associates that have been found guilty of anything? Yes, lots of them. Lots of them. Me included. You included. Okay, so when you were called here to testify, you weren't called here to testify for any other reason than to tell the truth. Is that yeah. correct? Yes, Congresswoman. Now, we started this whole sham off because of the 1023. And that was debunked by you, was it not? Yes, Congresswoman. Way before we started this impeachment inquiry. And you mentioned a number of times this guy by the name of Rudy Giuliani. Yes. Now, you know, everybody is so stressed about the fact that Hunter ain't here today. But, you know, Hunter came and testified behind closed doors for over six hours. And every single one of them, they weren't limited to five minutes. They could ask whatever they wanted to. And there is a full transcript of his testimony. So I don't know what else they wanted to do besides the fact that they wanted to put on the show. But let me tell you something. This whole thing is based upon something that Giuliani came up with. Yes. And, and we tried to subpoena him if I'm... That's what I remember, if anybody else remember, We tried, we asked, we said, hey, we should subpoena Giuliani. But you know, kind of like when we were trying to get his cell phone, they shut it down, right? Like, they don't want the facts. But you would agree with me that considering the fact that you were working under Rudy Giuliani at the time that you went over to Ukraine, that he has maybe some valuable information that he could offer this committee as to whether or not there's anything that we should be investigating in the first place. Absolutely, Congresswoman. I wish that this committee would subpoena Rudy Giuliani, put him under oath alongside me to get to the bottom of the truth of what actually happened in Ukraine and to the manipulation that Trump and Giuliani and the team went to do. I, I agree with you, but somehow it doesn't look like we're going to get there. And I thank you for your time. Uh Oh, another BS hearing, Scott. Uh, and she was just like on his ass. Like, is that a question? Yo, you know when I ask your ass a question. <laughs> She's a sharp. She's a sharp legislator, sharp lawyer, I think, who just happens to be a black woman. And I say it like that because I don't like undermining her excellence by saying she's a strong black woman. No, she's a strong, bright, capable legislator who happens to be black. That's my new thing. And I'll be honest with you, I've seen her in action a few times on the uh, on the Hill at these hearings. And she's young, you know, and she's fearless. And she's a, a lion or a lioness. And I got to tell you, she's going to be a weapon. And she's Democrat my congresswoman. In the future. Is, is she really? She's your congresswoman, too? I thought you lived yes. in uh, Virginia. Yeah, yes. I, no, 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 no. Hold up, hold up. No, 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 not to. Let me explain something to you. No, 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 no. Let me explain. See again, though. See you, cappers. See you here. You here. You here. You uninformed cappers. Is that what you say? You uninformed cappers. Let me listen. You uninformed capper. Listen to me. Let me explain something to you. Texas as a home. Texas has a homestead law. So my home there is my homestead. I am still registered. I see right there. See whatever. You ain't informed because you. Because you, because you cappers, because you cappers have limited knowledge of America. Uh, yeah, Rebecca, what I you saw the there was you saw her, you, Texas you saw you, Rebecca, you saw her checking, you saw her checking him, Rebecca, <laughs> and he tried to get, he tried, you know, he tried to get a little froggy. She's like, all right, don't jump. 
<laughs> you know, I, I would say her being a strong black woman, her being a black one, woman is a golden crown. So I'll always leave that she is a black woman who is an excellent legislature on your behalf and other Texans in the Dallas area. All right, fair enough. I, I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, I really like seeing how she's evolving on the national scale. And when people talk about what is the future specifically of the Democratic Party, we are looking in real time at the future of the Democratic Party. One thing mm -hmm. that I appreciate about Congresswoman Crockett is that even though she is a part of the Democratic Party and the apparatus, um, she also leads with mm -hmm. black values. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Don't mm -hmm. just be elected to Congress mm -hmm. as a black woman, as a black legislature, mm -hmm. but also make sure that you are leading with black values that brings the entire community along. So I appreciate watching her in action. Todd? It was reminiscent of what I've seen my mama do in the house many a time. Let me assure you <laughs> that if you dare come the wrong way, mama has a can of whoop ass right here <laughs> by the side. <laughs> and she's going to keep her curls in place. She's not going to lose her dignity. But when it's all said and done, if you decide you want to talk back to me, you will know when I ask you a question when I'm done talking. That is classic out of the playbook of black excellence called Mama. Kudos to Congresswoman Crockett. And I like the fact that she got Lev to say, I want Rudy to come sit next to me, too. At the end of the day, Mama Wit will ruin all of your hustle and make everybody look like blithering idiots. And not one person that I heard from that clip came hey, back. Hey, Todd, the only thing she left out was... Absolutely, bring so... Bring a switch with you. <laughs> <laughs> that part. Bring that switch. Well, we only, re we only, we only reserve that for unruly cappers. All right, Todd, <laughs> Rebecca... Uh, uh, look, hey, Apple Scott, Scott Bolden. Bolden. Go right we'll appreciate. Uh, say my name. Say my name. What? Al Alla wishes. Alla wishes. Say my name. Yeah, Alla you wishes. Your driver's license. Well, well first of all, I, what, 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 what was, what, what was your? Uh, oh, see, I see. Look at that. See, look, you got Todd throwing the ice up. So you got you got Rebecca over there. She, Rebecca, ain't you AK? <laughs> yes, I am. First Sam. <laughs> All right, we got, uh, we got. Oh, God. We, we, God. We, and we got Scott, and we got, and we got Scott over there dropping canes. Or, or shitty, uh, whatever the hell y'all do these days. Uh, I, I don't know Stop what y'all do. I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know what I don't know what the hell y'all do. I don't know what the hell y'all do. So, uh, y'all do whatever. We don't care. All right, that's it, y'all. Uh, yeah, we don't. Just close the show out now. You gotta talk about the Capitals. Just close the show out because I got something to go do. <laughs> See, let let let, let me hold oh, on. Let, let me pull go. up my here iPad. We go. About to <laughs> let, 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 let me, let me, let me find it. I've got to go. We don't have time for this, Roland. Roland, you can tell us about giving your, let me your driver's license and, in Texas. You can talk more about that. Let, yeah, no, no, no. My, my, my driver's license is a Texas driver's license. Oh, uh -oh. I, I ain't, look, I ain't, matter of fact, I, I'm, I'm going to find a video on my iPad uh, of the Kappas dropping them canes at Clark Atlanta homecoming. Uh, and so we're going to keep that on a forever loop uh, for Scott. That's a rerun. No, no. We I got, got to count. Go. I, I actually, no. We got to count with me. You have to count the number of times the cane was dropped. I think we got to at least six Scott, times Scott. before it was over. Scott, y'all, oh, Scott, Scott, Scott y'all always drop it. Scott, Scott y'all always dropping canes, so hell, that ain't nothing new. Hey, man, I got to go, though. For this is like Groundhog Day. Pressing conference call. I got to do a conference call, man. I'll, I'll look at the cane dropping later. Yeah. I'm out. Hey, Todd, great talking to you. Yeah, all right, Kappa. Great, great to see you, you man. <laughs> Holla. All right. All right, folks, that's Holla. it for us. I appreciate it. <laughs> folks, we're going uh, to be restreaming our red carpet from uh, the Shirley red carpet last night. Uh, the doc the doc documentary, the movie uh, on Shirley, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, uh, airs on Netflix. It drops March 22nd. Uh, and so uh, y'all check it out. Uh, we got some great interviews. Uh, go to our YouTube channel. Go to Black Star Network app. 
You can see that. We're also setting up some additional interviews you're gonna be able to see uh, as well. So uh, we're definitely supportive of that. Uh, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman elected to Congress, 1968. And so you don't want uh, to miss. Regina King did an absolutely amazing job directed by John Ridley. So uh, it was fantastic. So. Y'all be sure to uh, check it out. So, uh, and again, we want to thank Netflix for partnering with us. Uh, see, let me tell you what happened. All these other people, you know, stars, HBO, Showtime, Prime Video, Hulu, Peacock, uh, HBO Max, all these people, they always want their talent to come do our show. So they value our audience by wanting to send their talent to do the show. They never want to bring advertising dollars. And I'm like, no, y'all can't come on. Straight up, y'all can't come on. Uh, and so we appreciate that Netflix uh, respects our audience enough to say, hey, we have content, but we also have advertising dollars. And so we appreciate that. Folks, uh, that's it for us. Uh, be sure to support. First of all, I'm rocking, uh, drop the lower third. Y'all see I'm rocking, uh, rocking uh, St. Uh, St. Augustine's University. They have some difficult issues, uh, lost their accreditation. We're going to be talking about that uh, as well. But uh, I just want to go ahead and, you know, rock their uh, hoodie today. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. Be sure to support our Brina Funk fan club. You can join. The goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing on average. 50 bucks each is $4.19 a month, 30 uh, 13 cents a day. You can see your check and money order to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash App, Dallas Sign, RM Unfiltered. PayPal, R. Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zale, rolling at rollinsmartin.com. Rolling at rollinsmartinunfiltered.com. Be sure to download the Blackstar Network app. Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox One, Samsung Smart TV. You can also watch our 24-hour, seven-day-a-week channel uh, right here on, on uh, Amazon News by going to Amazon Fire. You can tell Alexa to play news from the Black Star Network. You can also check us out on Amazon uh, Freebie. Uh, first of all, Plex TV. Go to Plex TV, Amazon Freebie, and Amazon Prime Video. Also, y'all, be sure to um, get uh, my book, White Fear, How the Browning of America is Making White Folks Lose Their Minds, available. Bookstores nationwide. Download the audio version on Audible. And we're going to play in the second, so control room, get this ready. Uh, y'all, my one-on-one -on -one interview with one of the greatest uh, musicians, producers uh, in history, uh, Jimmy Jam. Uh, it is live. We're going to be we're gonna be restreaming that. Yeah, we, we streamed it early. I think, it, I think we're streaming it after the show as well, uh, right, Keenan? Uh, and so here is the promo for my interview with Jimmy Jam. Terry and I, we couldn't play in the white clubs in Minnesota. It felt like such a, um, you know, strength through adversity type mm -hmm. moment that I think black people just have to go through. You know, we have to figure it out, you know? Right. We make, we make, you know, lemons out of lemonade, but there's a reason we rented a ballroom, did our own show, promoted it, got like 1,500 people to come out, clubs were sitting empty. They were like, where's everybody at? And they said, they're down watching the band you wouldn't hire. So it taught us not only that we had to be, we had the talent of musicians, but we also had the, ta had the talent of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like a seat at the table. It's like, no, let's build the table. That's right. We got to build the table. And, That's right. And that was the thing. And of course, after that, we got all kinds of offers. Of course. Right, to come play in the clubs. But we didn't do it. We you're said, like, no, we're good. No, we're good. We're good. And that's what put us on a path of national. And of course, when Prince made it, then it was like, okay, we, we see it can be done. So be sure to check that out, my conversation with Jimmy Jam. That's it. I'll see y'all tomorrow right here. Rolling Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Holla! Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! I'm a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black 
own media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? 